Don't count your chickens before they hatch. One man's trash is another man's treasure. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't. Actions speak louder than Very good class. Of course, these are just some of the just a few of some of the very common English proverbs, uh, proverbs in the English language and and they are sayings that are you the people use as examples for our life situations to try to inject some truth into those life situations that we might encounter from day to day. You know, uh, don't count your chickens before they hatch. That's don't base your hopes on actions that some, on something that could happen. You know, if you uh, think you might get a new job in another town, it'd be wise to actually get the job before you quit your old job, pack up your house, and move to the new place. Or it might be a good idea to wait till you actually get the big bonus before you go out and buy the brand new car. These are the kind of things that, you know, don't count your chickens before they hatch. And of course, uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. You know, people place different value on different things. And this is a, a, gar- a garage sailor's motto, right? Uh, the one man's trash is another man's treasure. I love Shanna's nodding her head. I, I thought of you when I wrote that part because that, that, you go to these places and you see and people have a quarter on something. You're like, a quarter? I'd pay like 17,000 times that. But you get it for a quarter, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and one man's trash is another man's treasure. And then you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, you can, you can put the options in front of people. You can, you can kind of lead them and teach them. But in the end, they've got to they've make their own decisions, their own choices. This is one of the most, uh, frankly, frustrating parts of ministry uh, that I've experienced over the past 20 or so years. That, that uh, you know, you can, you can present the truth. You can present and try to lead people. But in the end, it's up to the people to care. You can't, you can't make anybody care. You've got you to uh, care from your heart. And so you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Or, you know, actions speak louder than words. And, you know, what we do uh, will, will actually overshadow or it may reinforce what we say. And so actions speak louder than words. And, and so, you know, most of these common English proverbs, they're, they're, they're true enough that most of us would agree with their premise. I, I went through a whole long list of them when I was preparing for this. And I thought, you know, there's only a couple of these that I would say, ah, I'm not so sure about that one. Most of them are pretty true. They, they, they seem like common sense. And, but their validity, it actually shines brightest when we see real-life examples of those things. For example, I could tell my kids, a penny saved is a penny earned. We probably would agree with that. that you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. And, and that would be true. You know, saving is a very important thing. But a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a penny saved as a penny earned conversation with my kids. And what we did is we pulled up some charts and graphs from the internet, and something looked like a little like this. And, and we showed them mathematically. You maybe not be able to see that exactly, but mathematically, the impact of saving. If you see here, uh, the, the big one there, it says 1511000 That's how much money you would have at age 65 if you started saving $5,000 a year at age 25. Okay. Then down at the bottom, you've got 661000 That's if you invest 5000 a year from the age uh, 35 to 65. That's how much you would have. But that middle line there, 850000 that's if you started saving $5,000 a year from the ages, from age of 25 to the age of 35, just for 10 years. If you did that, you would have $850,000. Now, I wish somebody would have shown that to me when I was a kid. To know that if I could, sa- I could save, uh, well, basically the total investment would be $50,000 and I would get so much more if I saved it in the first 10 years of 25 to 35 instead of going from 35 to 65. And so, you know, th- th- this is a penny saved, is a penny earned. When you see that, my kids were like, whoa. And so I said, see how you should save your money and not spend it on stupid stuff. And of course, I was speaking from experience and, and tried to, to share with them, you know, and, and the, the, the reality of those things. And so that kind of made a, a bigger impact on them, I think. Or let's say that you want to teach your children that they should be prudent and not too risky in life. And you're going to teach them that a, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You've heard that one before. Well, maybe one of the things you could do is you could, you could break out an old episode, maybe go to the Game Show Network and find an old episode of Let's Make a Deal. How many remember Let's Make a Deal? 
I love Let's Make a Deal. They had reruns on when I was a kid. They actually have a new version of this, I guess, with Wayne Brady as the host. Not, he's, he can't be Monty Hall, though. There's just no other Monty Hall. But if you remember Let's Make a Deal, they'd have people dress up in different costumes, and, and Monty Hall would do different things, and he would, you know, like a scavenger hunt with people's purses. And I, you know, women would bring in, like, bags, like, three times the size of themselves just to make sure they could pack everything in there and have something that, that he might ask for, and they would, he would give them cash. And they'd have this cash, and he'd always say, okay, you can keep this cash, or he'd play these games, and you can keep this $1,000, or you can trade it for what's behind door number one. And then the audience would be yelling and screaming, yeah, trade it, no, don't trade it, no, no. And then, you know, every once in a while, what would happen is behind door number one would be like a live goat or something, Right? That they traded all that money for a goat, for some lame prize. And so you could say, see, kids, uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That, that having that money there is, is worth a lot more than what you could get behind door number one, two, or three. Of course, then they could flip it around if they've seen the show. And they could say, well, look, this guy traded $1,000 for that new car. And so nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So you got to be careful there, perhaps, with your, uh, with your, ex- with your examples there. Or perhaps maybe I could teach my kids don't judge a book by its cover. And, and to tell that story or to teach them that, that, that lesson, I could tell them the story of the young preacher who was doing a wedding. And it was the evening of the wedding rehearsal, and a man came to the rehearsal on a motorcycle, and he, he was wearing uh, blue jeans and short sleeves that revealed some tattoos, and he had, uh, he had a, a long goatee, and he had an eyebrow ring. And as the case is with, is with many weddings, you know, that before the rehearsal starts, they're kind of milling around. And, and sometimes you've got uh, people that don't really know each other. You know, people from the, from the husband's or the groom's family, people from the bride's family, friends, and that sort of thing. They come from all over the country. And so nobody really knows who belongs with who. And so you're kind of mingling around. Well, all of a sudden, this, this wild-looking guy stands up and starts directing people. And tells them what to do and starts running the ceremony and that sort of thing. And, and uh, he started giving directions and all seems to go well. And the rehearsal went off without a hitch. But as soon as the rehearsal was over, the flower girl, who was probably not more than four or five years old, walked up to this man and looked at him with skepticism in her eye and hands on her hips and said, Surely you're not the real preacher. It's been 14 years since I did Lindy and Joe's wedding and people still ask me. <laughs> if I am the real preacher. (laughs) But as you can see, when you have big concepts, it's easy to agree with their truthfulness. But having an example of uh, really helps us see what that truth looks like in, in real life. Well, the writings of the Apostle Paul, if you go through the New Testament and see these writings of the Apostle Paul, they have some really big heavy concepts. His letters, especially those that were circulated among the churches, they're just full of big spiritual truths. I picked three really big ones. Uh, Take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You've heard this one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Now, we're probably pretty familiar with that, but that's a really big spiritual truth, that the old is gone and the new has come. That's really a big theological thing. Colossians 3.13, Paul writes, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. If you really think about what that means, that's pretty deep. That's pretty heavy stuff. Or maybe you look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where Paul wrote, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And that's a truth that we would all, I think all these truths, we'd probably say, yeah, I believe that, that in Christ I'm a new creation. I believe that, that we should forgive as the Lord forgi- has forgiven us and that we all are, uh, all are all one in Christ. They're pretty big concepts. But wouldn't it be nice if we had an example of what Paul was talking about in these three big truths and others as well? Well, it just so happens that tucked away in the New Testament is a little book that you probably haven't opened in a while. It's called the book of Philemon. You can go ahead and go to your table of contents if you need to, to find it. It doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's a book, the book of Philemon. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. And, and Philemon is the third shortest book in the Bible. It's the third shortest book in the Bible. It was written by the Apostle Paul. And like his other books, Philemon was a letter. But unlike most of his other books, the letter was not to a church. And, and unlike his letter to Timothy and Titus, which were letters to individuals, this letter was very personal in nature and content, speaking to a very specific situation. 
However, the personal nature of this letter doesn't mean that we cannot apply it. It doesn't, not, doesn't mean that we can't learn from it today. In fact, it serves as a great example of those three big concepts we talked about from Paul and actually many other concepts uh, of faith uh, in Christ put to real life, a real life example of those concepts. So we're going to walk through the, this short letter this morning and talk about what truth we see in it, what truth God has for us in it today. Starting with verse 1. Paul writes, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're familiar with Paul's letters, and if you understand kind of how he starts them off, you may notice right off the bat that, simply, that Paul simply identifies himself here as a prisoner of Jesus, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's how he starts it out. He identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And if you go back and you look at, at letters like uh, First and Second Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and some of those letters, he starts out by saying, Paul, an apostle. He, he always starts, generally speaking, not always, but, but the majority of his letters start out with Paul saying that he is an apostle. And this is one of the very few letters which he doesn't do that. And it speaks to the very personal nature of this letter. It's kind of like this. Is if I was writing a letter to my sister or to my mother, I would say, Dear Mom or Dear Lindsay, and I would sign it, Your Son or Your Brother, Chris. I wouldn't say, uh, write the ni nice letter, Dear Mom, and at the end put, Sincerely, Lead Minister, Chris Beard, or sincerely, PhD candidate, Chris Beard. I wouldn't put my, my title, I wouldn't put my, my credentials in that letter because this is my mom that I'm talking to. This is her baby boy. This is my sister I'm talking to. This is her big brother. And so it would be more personal in nature. I'd say, I love you, mom, Chris, or I love you, sis, Chris, or whatever the case may be. It'd be very, very uh, personal in nature. That's what Paul does here. It's more personal in nature. He doesn't have to say, I am the apostle. He doesn't say, I am the, your fellow worker in the, you know, in the, or he does say fellow worker to Philemon here, but he doesn't say, you know, here's my authority, here are my credentials, as he does in some of the other letters. But it also speaks to the tone of this letter as well. We're going to see that this letter is less authoritative uh, and less directive and more loving. It's a more loving plea, and we're going to get into that as we, as we go along here. We see that this letter was written to Philemon. He was a fellow Christian. He was part of the Colossian church. And uh, Aphia is likely Philemon's wife. And many scholars believe that Archippus was both the son of Philemon as well as a minister to the Colossian church. Because if you go back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, uh, he he's told to complete his ministry in the Lord. And so this is probably a nice little family that's a part of the Colossian church. And that Paul mentions that the church meets in, in Philemon's home, it shows that he was likely a wealthy man. Most people at that time in history, they lived in single-room dwellings. And, uh, of course, they didn't have uh, the, the first Christian church of Jerusalem or uh, the Colossian church of Christ or whatever the case may be, where there was a building where they would meet. And so they would meet in people's homes. And to say that, that the uh, church met in Philemon's home would say that he had a house big enough to, 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 to hold people. And he, had some, he, he was wealthy enough to have a house to do that. Of course, we're going to see also that he was wealthy enough to have many servants as well. Verse 4, Paul writes, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. This is a pretty good resume for Philemon here, for to have Paul say these wonderful things about him. That Paul says he's thankful for him because of his love. He's thankful for him because of his faith. He says he calls it, said that he's a partner with Paul, a partnership with us in the faith. And that word partnership, by the way, is the word koinonia, meaning a deep relationship, a deep connection, a deep partnership. His love, he says here, that it caused joy and encouragement to Paul because Philemon had refreshed the hearts of God's people. I, I hope and pray that I can have that on my resume. I don't want to be the, the, the guy that, that God says, well, you're the preacher that, that caused strife and suffering for your people. I want, you, I want to be someone that, to be like Philemon that can, that can refresh the hearts of the Lord's people. And then you have verse 6. And verse 6 happens to be one of my favorite verses in the Bible. 
because it actually shows how God grows our understanding. Read there, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. And so this partnership of the faith that Paul speaks of, what that really is, is the entirety of God's expectations of his followers. Partnership in the faith means every aspect of expectation that we have as disciples of Jesus. It's this idea of, of obedience. We are to follow God and to, to, to study his word and to obey his word, to follow through in action on the things that he expects from us. That's, a, that's a, a component that God expects from a disciple. And of course, community, that God expects us to live with, uh, with one another, to, to do life together with one another. And in that, we're going to learn from one another and grow and learn how to be more like Christ. And of course, then there's mission as well, that we are called to, to go and proclaim the good news to people who need it people who don't know Jesus and to to bring people to Christ and to love in a holistic way, to love, serve, and to make this, you know, to to, to bring heaven to earth, as it were, and join God in his redemptive mission. And here's the great thing about those three things. When you obey, when you are in God's community, and when you are carrying out in a part of God's mission, when those things are present in our life, we learn more about God than we could otherwise. And then when we are active in that partnership of the faith, that will then deepen our understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Now, I love studying the Bible. I'm kind of, I've been known and called a nerd at, at times. And I like to read about the Bible and read the, the perspectives of, of, of interpretation. I, I love just diving into the scripture. I love the Bible studies that we have going on. But you know, Paul didn't say, I pray that your Bible studies in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing. But the entirety, the partnership, the study, the carrying out, the community, and the the, the mission that goes through. And Paul says that when these things are active in our lives, that God will use those to understand uh, everything about God. Everything about God. Paul continues in verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none, it is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. Now Paul starts this section with the word therefore, which means he's pointing back to what he just said. And what he just said was that he, you know, he looked at uh, Philemon's great resume, the, the love that he had, the faith that he had, the partnership that he had, and that all those things uh, really spoke to what, why Paul was asking him to do what he was doing. Because Philemon is full of love and faith, because he's a partner in the gospel, because he has refreshed the hearts of God's people, Paul approaches him with an appeal. Now, he could have approached him more harshly. He could have rebuked him. He could have stated the truth bluntly and, and, you know, presented his authority to say, here's the situation. You listen to me because here's what Christ expects from you and here's what you need to do. He could have done that. Paul had done that before, by the way, in different letters. He did speak clearly. He did speak bluntly. But he said, you know, I could do that. I could say, listen, I know what's right and you, you need to follow what's right. He said, but instead I want to appeal to you. I want you to, to listen up. I want you to, to, to take a note of what I'm about to tell you. He says, here I am. He says, I'm Paul. I'm just coming to you not as an apostle. I'm not coming to you as a, as a leader, as, a, as your spiritual father. I'm just coming to you as me, an old guy in a prison. It's just me. And I'm a prisoner of Christ and I'm your friend. So Paul makes an appeal on a, behalf of a man named Onesimus. And what we see in this letter is that Onesimus was a slave in Philemon's household. And at some point he ran away and most likely he stole from Philemon when he left. I don't know if he took money. I don't know if he took valuables. I don't know what he took, but, but apparently he, he took something from Philemon when he left. And he likely made his way to Rome. Rome would have been a great place for a slave to escape to because it was the metropolis. It was packed full of people. And if you wanted to blend in, you could really get lost in the crowd of Rome. And he probably did that in order to not be found and to be returned to uh, Philemon. But somehow, we don't know how, but somehow Onesimus ended up meeting Paul and as Paul wrote, he became Paul's son while in Rome. 
Now, what he meant here is that he was his son, meaning there was a deep relationship, that they got to know one another, that there was a love that developed there, that that relationship, that deep relationship was there. But it also meant uh, very likely and, and almost surely that son, meaning that Paul led Onesimus to Christ. That, that for whatever reason, they came into contact with one another, and Paul used that opportunity to lead Onesimus to Jesus. And so while Onesimus was, a use, was, was useless to Philemon, uh, someone who left Philemon's household and stole in the process, Paul says now that Onesimus is useful to both Paul and to Philemon. Verse 12, Paul writes, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in the chains for, for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you, would, you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. So Paul speaks of his deep love for Onesimus. He talks about how he's, he's, he's his very heart and he says he's going to send him back to Philemon. And then he, he, he speaks of how useful Onesimus has been to him. And he doesn't speak of the specifics, but, you know, Paul was under house arrest, probably stuck in one place, and Onesimus probably maybe ran errands. He served him in various ways and certainly, at the very least, kept Paul company while he was stuck, while he was in prison. And Paul says, you know, I would have loved, I would have loved to keep Onesimus with me, but he knew that there were bigger things to deal with here. He knew that there was a broken relationship. He knew that there was uh, some issues that, that need to be taken care of for God's glory. So in verse 15, Paul says, Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. And Paul says to Philemon here, he says, Look at what God has done. He took this bad situation, he's used it for his glory, and while Onesimus was a fugitive thief, God used his escape to bring him to faith in Christ. And this reminds me of uh, the story of Joseph and his brothers in the book of Genesis. You remember that story where they hated Joseph because his father, he was his father's favorite kid, and, and he gave him the coat of many, many colors. And so his brothers, they plotted against him, you know, and, and uh, this is worse than just normal brother hazing. They actually uh, threw him into a well and put goat's blood on the coat and told their dad that, that he was dead. And then there were some people that came by and they sold Joseph into slavery. He ended up in Egypt. And you know that story about how he was in prison. He was then he was he became a, the, the right hand man to Pharaoh and all this thing. And so in the midst of this bad experience, I mean, because you don't want to get sold into slavery by your brothers. It's not a very good thing. And so in the midst of this bad experience and all this kind of thing, of course, in the end, there was famine. And Joseph's position saved his family. And so in, in Genesis chapter five, verse, or 50, verse 20, Joseph said to his brothers, and he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so what we see here in in, in Philemon is that the theft and the escape of Onesimus, it may have been seen uh, seen as harmful by Philemon, by not a good situation, by not a bad situation, by not not, not something that was uh, a happy occasion, but God still used that mistake, that sin, of Onesimus for his glory and use that opportunity. He took that bad situation and turned it into the ultimate good. But then Paul makes a bold statement in verse 16. He says that because of what Christ had done in the life of Onesimus, Philemon can receive him not as a slave, but as a dear brother. Let that, just just let that sink in for a moment of what he's saying. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. You see, slavery has almost always been an evil part of society throughout history. And it's something that we as Christians should absolutely stand up against. We should be actively against, no matter what form it may take, whether it be the injustice of one person owning another or be it the horrible sex slave problem that has affected millions across this world this very day. It's something we should stand against. We should not stand for. We should, we should rise against. We should support. We should love. We should help bring justice in those situations. But regardless of what unjust societal structures we may fight against, we need to know that there is nothing more equalizing than having Christ in common. There's nothing more equalizing 
than having Christ in common. And, while, and when we have Christ in common, it outweighs any differences that we may have. And Philemon, the slave owner, and Onesimus, the slave, are now brothers in Christ. And that you may have a mean, nasty boss that, that, that treats you bad, and you might be uh, you know, a bad employee, but together you can, you can be one in Christ. You may be a, a Democrat, and I may be a Republican, but we can be one in Christ. That you may be black, and I may be white, but we can be one in Christ. That you may be uh, from the Middle East, and I may be from America, but we can be one in Christ because there's no greater equalizer than Christ. And it's not about our history. It's not about where we've come from. It's not about where we were born or, or what we've come to know is custom in our life, but it's about who Jesus is in our life. And so there's nothing that's more equalizing that brings the greatest of the great in man's eyes, maybe down a notch or two, and the lowest of the low, bringing them up, because we are all one in Christ Jesus, as Paul said in Galatians. As Paul said that in Christ, even slave and master can be dear brothers, and he continues in verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done anything, you, done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. One more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirits. So Paul tells Philemon, he says, I want you to welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me, as a brother in Christ. And then he says, whatever Onesimus owes, whatever he may have stolen, Philemon can put that debt on Paul. That, that uh, You can just take that account whatever he owes you from stealing from you, then you can just put that on my head, that I'll pay you back and I'll, and I'll, and I'll owe that to you. And Paul is confident that Philemon is going to be obedient to Christ and will exceed Paul's expectations that he can look forward to the day when he can see Philemon face to face. And that's the book of Philemon. So what's the point? Out of all the letters where Paul addresses the churches and offers this incredible theological teachings and truth, then why do we have this short letter to a friend? And what can we learn from this? Well, certainly we are to learn the importance of forgiveness. I think that's important to understand and to see that even though the word forgiveness never actually appears in this letter, it's a theme throughout the letter. Forgiveness is important, but there's a couple of other big things that I really don't want us to miss here in this letter. A couple of big things that we see. And the first theme, the first big thing is that Christ changes everything. Consider how Paul speaks of the change in Onesimus. Remember this fugitive thief slave? Verse 11, Paul says to Philemon that, you know, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful to both you and me. And the interesting thing here is that Paul is, is using kind of a play on words uh, with Onesimus' name. His name uh, literally meant profitable or useful. And so Paul says, you know what? Uh, listen, I know his name is useful, but to you it might as well have been a dirty, rotten thief. I know you, his name is useful, but he might as well have been just worthless to you. You might as well have called him worthless. Might, his name might have been, might as well have been Mud. You know, it's just, it, it, his name was Onesimus, but he wasn't living up to that name. But he says something had changed. Something had changed, and Onesimus was actually living up to his name. That he was now useful. He was truly Onesimus. And so what we see here is that his character had changed because of his faith in Christ. That was the only thing that changed in this story here about Onesimus. It wasn't that he uh, was educated. It wasn't that he was, uh, that he was liberated. It wasn't anything other than the fact that Christ came into his life. And we see that formerly he was worthless and useless because of his character. But now he was useful to Paul, to Philemon, to others because of Christ. Verse 12 Paul indicates a change of heart in Onesimus. 
He writes this, he says, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. You know, I've come to realize something as a parent. I've come to realize that my kids are now at the age where they're doing a lot of stuff without me. It freaked me out a little bit on Friday when Carrie said, Nate and Laney are going to the ball game, and we are not. What? I can't send my babies out to the ball game by themselves. And I realized that, that, that my kids are at that age now when they're going to be doing stuff where I'm not going to be around. And that's a scary thing for a parent because, you know, I spend a lot of my time trying, you know, really being near them, being around them and teaching them. And the thing about that was that, that when it came to, to how they acted around other people, dad was always there ready to give the stink eye or worse if needed. I was always there right beside them. If they messed up, I could put them back in line right away. And it was, there was no question about that, that if they took the wrong path, I could grab them by the, uh, the back of their shirt and put them right where they belong and, and, and do that you know, day after day after day. But here's this realization that I came to. In fact, I, the good thing was is I realized this a long time before they started doing things on their own, is I realized there'd be a point where I couldn't grab them by the back of their shirt anymore. Nate, I have to do this to do that now. I couldn't grab them by the back of their shirt, that they weren't going to have me behind them to give them the, the folded arms and the dad's stink eye if they messed, messed up. And so what I realized is that I had to teach them something different, that I had to teach them not just how to behave, but I had to teach them to have the heart of obedience and understand why they needed to obey, that it wasn't just a matter of you need to obey or dad's going to, you know, you're going to get in trouble with dad. That, that, that's good. That's a good motivator when they're little for a while, but there's, there's a point where they either outgrow dad or dad's not there anymore. And they can get away with whatever they want to while dad's not around. So you have to teach them about, you have to change their heart. You have to change their heart. You have to show them and teach them how to have that. Cause, because and you know the difference, right? One difference is, is surface behavior and one is the, the, the obedience that comes from the heart. And Paul doesn't say it explicitly here in, in Philemon, but I believe that going back to Philemon was at least in part Onesimus' idea. I believe with my, in my heart that, that what we see here, that between, if you read between the lines, that Paul had led Onesimus to Christ. He was discipling Onesimus, as God had called him to do. And somewhere along the way, Onesimus said, maybe Paul was teaching on, uh, on love and loving your brother or respecting or generosity Maybe he was teaching him about God and Christ and what Christ had done. And, and, and he's talking to Onesimus, and Onesimus, maybe, maybe the light bulb kind of goes off, and he says, wait a second. What I did to Philemon is not very Christ-like, is it? And Paul probably said, you're on to something there. What do you think you ought to do about it? And Onesimus may have said, I got to go back. I got to go back. And the reason I believe that's the case here is because Paul was not a parent that would have been right behind Onesimus. When he says, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you, let's be honest about the fact that Onesimus could have gone anywhere he wanted to. Paul was not sending him with armed guards. He was not sending him with threat of punishment. I believe that he was sending him with a heart Full that with in Onesimus was heart was full of repentance and love for Philemon. We see that Onesimus submitted himself to serving Paul, putting aside his own desires, and then of course we see the reality of 2 Corinthians 5:17 in that that, uh, that that in Christ the new creation has come and the old is gone. Verse 13. We see example of this. We see evidence of this where Paul says that uh, that his service is now valuable to. Paul, Onesimus' service. Again, as I just said, that what happened is that, okay, his character changed. He was useless, now he's useful. His heart changed, and now he realizes he's got to go back to Philemon, but also he was no longer selfish. That he could, he, he was serving Paul with all his heart. He was serving others, you know, getting rid of that selfish desire. And of course, again, he, he was a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And so we see in Onesimus, that when you come in contact with Christ, because again, the only thing that we see changed here is Jesus came into his life. So Christ changes everything, and we see that in the example of Onesimus, but that's not all that changes. Can you imagine the scene here? That Philemon wakes up one day, and 
Onesimus is gone, and not only is Onesimus missing, but Philemon's lockbox is open, and his valuables are missing as well. And of course, Philemon searches for Onesimus, but he doesn't find him. And of course, you know, what are you going to do? You send out a search party, you can't find him, life goes on. Then one day, Philemon hears a little knock at the door, and he wonders what's going on. And so he walks up to the door, and he opens it up, and there standing in front of him is this dirty, rotten thief of a slave, Onesimus. Taken aback, Philemon asks Onesimus, what what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Onesimus says, I have something for you. And so he maybe opens a knapsack and he he reaches in and Philemon thinks, is this guy really going to pay me back? Is he really going to give me back grandma's silver? Is he really really going to give me back the stuff that he took from me? And he reaches into his knapsack and he pulls out a letter. A letter. It's a letter from Philemon's friend, Paul. You see, what happened here in this situation is that, legally speaking, there were a few kinds of recourse that could have been done against Onesimus, both for escaping and for stealing. Things like torture, things like lifelong prison, things like execution, all things would have been legal and most likely expected for the crimes that Onesimus committed against Philemon. But here he is standing at the door, rightfully to be executed or tortured or whatever the case may be, and and all he has to offer Philemon is this letter. This letter Paul says to Philemon, treat him as you would treat me. Accept him as you would accept me. Now think about that for a moment. How would Philemon have accepted Paul? I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have killed him. Pretty sure he wouldn't have tortured him, wouldn't have thrown him in jail. But not only that, I'm pretty sure that he would have accepted him and given him a hug. He would have found his best place to to sleep at night. He would have prepared the best meal he could have. He would have given him a great, uh, you know, had his servants come and wash his feet. He would have done all these things for Paul because Paul was a beloved brother, spiritual father, as it were, as we read in this letter. You would have been thankful to see Paul. And Paul says, this guy that you have every right to kill that stands before you, I want you to accept him as you accept me. Now, the book of Philemon doesn't tell us how the story ends. After all, it's just a letter from Paul to Philemon. But there are some historic church documents that may give us some insight. There's some extra biblical things and documents from the early church that that actually talk about Philemon. And they actually say that Philemon, after a time, actually set Onesimus free after accepting him into his household. And we also learn in in these documents that Onesimus became an elder in the church in Berea, and eventually he became a martyr and he died for his faith. And I believe this. I believe this is true. I believe that those accounts are real. And I believe it because the early church considered this to be part of God's Scripture. And I think the reason they considered it to be a great example of what Paul was teaching in his other letters is because they knew that Philemon had followed through and was obedient, as Paul expected. And so I believe that Philemon did accept Onesimus as a brother because of what Paul said in this letter. And here's, what Paul, here's the amazing thing is that what Paul said in this letter, it wasn't what Paul said about Onesimus that got Philemon's attention. That's not what made him obedient. I, I, I mean, if you've got a dirty, rotten scoundrel standing before you, it's gonna be, you're still going to be a little skeptical when one of your buddies says, oh, no, he's good. He's a great guy. Trust me, he's, he's, he's been helping me out around the, you know, he's just, he's a great guy. He's changed. He's a great guy. I don't believe that that's why uh, uh, Philemon showed mercy and grace to Onesimus. I don't believe that what Paul said about Onesimus is what Philemon made, made Philemon go, you know what, For, forget it, you're forgiven. Come into my house. I think what made Philemon give mercy and grace was that Paul reminded him of who Philemon was and who he is in Christ. See, the motivation for, for Philemon to give mercy and grace to Onesimus was not Onesimus' change. The motivation for that was not because Onesimus had become a better guy or had found Christ. The motivation was that Philemon had Christ. 
and that the love and faith that he had, the, 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 the Christ changes everything. And church, let me tell you this. If there is one thing that is going to be the biggest change in our lives as Christians, it's this forfeiture of rights. We live in a society where rights are held and we, 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 we hide them, hold them in high regard and we view them and almost idolize them. But we see that in Christ, Christ says, you don't have any rights to hold on to. It's all about love. It's all about submission. And even though Philemon was in every right, had every right to punish or to demand retribution or to, to execute Onesimus, Paul pleaded with him on the basis of his relationship with Jesus to submit to his brother Onesimus. And so we see that in this letter that Christ changes everything, that it changes who we are as it did with Onesimus, that it changes our character, it changes our being, it changes our heart, it changes our selfishness to, to, to selflessness, to sacrifice. And then we see, of course, that it changes how we treat others. It means that we trade our rights for love as Philemon did as well. But I believe there's one other thing that this letter shows, that if, and it shows that if we are in Christ, then our lives will be a picture of the gospel. Our lives will be a picture of the gospel. You see, this account of Paul and Onesimus and Philemon, it's a wonderful picture of what Christ has done. It's a wonderful microcosm of what Jesus did. Think about this. In this account, Onesimus rebelled against his master, stole from him, insulted him, escaped, ran away from him, just as mankind has rebelled against God. And Paul finds Onesimus and brings him to faith just as Jesus was sent to seek and save the lost. And Paul identifies with Onesimus, telling Philemon to accept Onesimus as if he were Paul, just as Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And Paul intercedes for Onesimus and offers to pay his debt to Philemon, just as Christ interceded for us on the cross and offers to pay the debt for our sin. And if history is correct, Philemon accepts Onesimus on Paul's account, just as the Father accepts us based on what Jesus has done. And so we can find ourselves in this account. And Martin Luther actually proclaimed, he said, we are all Onesimi. I love that. We are all Onesimi if we are in Christ. And therefore, if Christ truly does change everything, then the gospel of Christ should be seen in our lives as we live it out, just as it was seen in Paul and in Onesimus and in Philemon. That the way we serve, it points the world to a Savior who came to serve all mankind. That the way we forgive resembles the mercy and grace that our Savior exhibits to us. That our lives are characterized by selfless sacrifice that is a picture of the Savior who emptied himself. That we obey with such reckless abandon that people see that for us to live is Christ. That we have such hope that those around us see that we don't live for the things of today. We don't live for the temporary, but we live for the eternal. And that our love might be so extravagant that people note that we are followers of Christ. That our marriages... In our marriages, people see Jesus, that in our jobs, the gospel is lived out, that in our relationships, we bring glory to God, that in every area of our life, we then may be like Paul, who said in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for every part of your scripture, and thank you for the parts that we sometimes forget about. Thank you for the story of Paul and Onesimus and Philemon and the example that was seen in that and the love and forgiveness and the truth that Christ changes everything. Lord, I pray that as we live our lives, just as this story about Paul and Onesimus and Philemon shows us a small picture of what Christ did for us, that each and every day that we will be able to live out the gospel story in such a way that people will be able to say, that is what that's about. Now I get it. Help us to have the attitude of Christ. Help us to submit to you and to one another. Help us to see, help us to change, help us to be who you've intended for us to be as we are partnerships, as we have fellowship in faith. 
Praise in Jesus' name. Let's stand as we sing.